Pastor Cromard from the Independent Bible Church in Duryea, and we were at our Sunday school time, and uh, we're in the book of Revelation. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the opportunity that you've given to us to meet together today. We're trusting by your grace that you will enable us to understand a little bit more about these seven churches in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and chapter 3. And Lord, that we might apply some things to the day and age in which we live. Well, thank you for that help. As folks uh, come on by Zoom and by Facebook, we pray that you will bless uh, and encourage us, my Heavenly Father, to live for thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, we have been looking at uh, the church of Laodicea in chapter number uh, 3. Uh, and I want to read from verse 14 once again to the end of the chapter. It says, And under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen. The faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. We'll come back to that in just a second. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white, white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, if you're following along in your booklet that uh, we gave you prior to all of this uh, indecision that has come upon our world, we are on page number 18, and we are at the point that you can see in your uh, PowerPoint, and if I can get my, whoops, didn't want to do that. Uh, if you can see on the PowerPoint my mouse uh, circling around there, we're, we're right here. Let's go back to the top of the page, and we're not going to turn to these uh, references, but I want to go back and let you know that in, in the book of Acts, there were hints that were given to us and how the gospel got uh, to the uh, area of Laodicea. Uh, Paul's work there in La amongst the Laodiceans is seen in chapter number 18, verses, uh, verse 19 through chapter 19, verse number 41. Uh, and, uh, and Paul wrote to them from Colossae, if you remember in Colossians 4, 16, that they were to exchange books we're not going to get all bent out of shape saying that, well, there's a, a book of the Laodiceans that is missing. If God wanted it in his word, it would be there. Because he is the one that does inspiration. He's the one that brings together the books of the Bible. We call that, from a human perspective, uh, the canon of Scripture. Uh, but God would have superintended over that to make sure that that book was there. Uh, many, uh, many feel that what was written to the Colossians was also the same material that was written to the Laodiceans. Uh, and so there's that overlap, uh, and uh, so we're not missing anything. Now, it is interesting that we come up to this next point, and that is that Laodicea became the see of a bishop, uh, and its clergy attended uh, the great church uh, councils of Nicaea in A.D. 325 uh, and in Constantinople in A.D. 381 and others. Let me give you just a little bit of church history uh, at this point. As the church grew and developed, now you're looking at a couple of centuries since the inception of the church uh, there in the upper room uh, as recorded for us in Acts chapter number 2. As the church developed and grew, what would happen is that uh, churches would be started, they would be small, but the metropolitan churches, the city churches, they were the ones that had more funds, they had more people, 
and consequently their pastors became known as metropolitan bishops. The metropolitan bishop was not supposed to be scripturally, but ended up being somebody who controlled many small churches around in the area. We would call them like a county or several counties or even states. Uh, and they, they stepped out of bounds scripturally and began to control those places. Well, what happened then is when church councils met together, like the Church Council of Nicaea in 325, to settle doctrinal issues, they were trying to clarify what they believed. These bishops, or the seat of where the, the, that metropolitan bishop, or the city uh, and his church, was called a see. Later on, in the 300s, coming up into the 360s, we find that that metropolitan bishop became overemphasized even one step further, and they elected a pope. Now, this is not found anywhere that we should be doing this in, in the Bible. Uh, every local church is a local church. Paul to Timothy, Paul to Titus, sent them out to start to plant local churches, which were, as far as we know from scripture, to be local churches, autonomous, that means self-governing, self uh, and they were to do the work of the ministry in that locale. It doesn't mean that they couldn't cooperate with churches of like faith, but it, it, it did not mean that each church was controlling one another. In a larger sense, every person who knows Christ as their savior is part of the, what we will call, and this is human terminology, the universal church. God just calls it the church everywhere, the church around the world. We're part of the body of Christ. So we can understand that a little bit better. Humans in their theology have put together uh, a doctrine that talks about the universal church. There's some that absolutely abhor that word. I don't really care. We're the body of Christ. So I have traveled to Malaysia, to India. I have been in Singapore. I've been in the Philippines, been in Mexico. I've been in the Car Caribbean. And every place I went, you know what I found? The body of Christ. And so there is a church there. If there's one person in an island out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and they know Jesus Christ is their savior, they belong to the body of Christ. And so we are brethren in the Lord. But then, in a smaller way, we belong to a local church, part of the body of Christ, in a community or in a locality. And so we call that the local church. So in the church history of Laodicea, we find that this bishop overstepped the boundaries and uh, not being scriptural, sent a delegation or sent their bishop to these councils where they were to sort out some Bible doctrine. Did that happen scripturally? Yes, Acts chapter 15. When you look at Acts chapter 15, what did they do? They didn't gather the bishops together, they gathered the elders together. They gathered the pastors of the local churches together, along with the apostles. And they settled a question as to whether or not the Gentiles needed to have circumcision like the Jews have circumcision administered to them. They also discussed whether or not the Spirit of God coming upon an individual uh, they were supposed to speak in tongues. They were also uh, uh, sorting out whether or not the Gentiles were supposed to follow the dietary regulations of the Jews. And of course, a letter was written from Jerusalem and sent out to all the local churches. Well, we find then that Laodicea was part of uh, something that took place a couple of centuries after those things had taken place. Let's take a look at the message of the Laodiceans, if you will. First of all, we find that Revelation 3.14 must be understood 
from another passage of scripture, and that's Isaiah chapter 65 and verse number 16. Let's go back there, Isaiah 65, 16, if you will. Come along with me. In Isaiah 65, verse number 16, it says this, that he who blessed himself in the earth shall bless himself in God of truth, and he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten, and because they are hid from mine eyes. Back to Revelation, chapter number 3, and verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. The Septuagint put truth as the 16th word in Isaiah chapter 65 and verse number 16. But the word Amen ought to be there. So the verse should read, that he who blessed himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of the Amen. So we're reminded that no man can be blessed unless the Amen blesses him. Let's also take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 20. Have you uh, heard a lot of people who are not Christians using the word blessed in the day that we live in? I've heard many people say, uh, when you ask them how they're doing, how are they do doing, they might, instead of saying, oh, well, we're okay, uh, or everything is fine, they're saying, we're blessed. Well, if somebody answers you that way, the next question you ought to ask them is, oh, you know Christ is your Savior? When were you born again? How are you following the things of God? Because nobody could be blessed unless the amen blesses him. Now, I know that there are uh, people who are blessed by the God of this world, and that's not really a blessing, that's a curse. Most of the time, it's a bribe to keep on following him. But you can't be blessed without following the Lord and knowing the Lord. Look at verse 20, if you will, of 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. For all the promises of God are, uh, in him are yea, and in him, amen under the glory of God by us. So we find here that there is a great, great, great understanding that nobody, no one in this world can be blessed except God blesses him. Let me bring in one other aspect of this. What brings about, according to Romans chapter number two, what brings about repentance in people? The answer is, the goodness of God. Uh, and so God uh, sends the rain upon the just and upon the unjust. If he sends the rain, he also sends the sunshine upon the just and upon the unjust. Aren't you glad that, uh, you know, the Lord provides food for the just and the unjust? So in many ways, they have the goodness of God giving them, given to them, but they're not enjoying the blessings of God in the way that the believer enjoys the blessings of God because only God can give blessings. They may have sustenance. They may have support. They have, may have a measure of life, but they don't have the great blessings that come from the amen because they're not of God. They enjoy everything that he has to provide as a thief enjoys the spoils of someone he's robbed. I want you to think about that just for a while. There's this interesting phrase in, uh, uh, here in Revelation chapter uh, number three concerning uh, the uh, children of, uh, of Laodicea. Uh, and I want to deal with that before I finish this particular chapter and before I run out of time. I've got about uh, 12 or 13 minutes left. You'll notice that it says 
that I know thy works, I'm in verse number 15, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now this is a, uh, this is a tremendous illustration for the people of Laodicea. I want you to imagine, and at some point I want you to go back to a map, and I want you to look at Colossae, and I want you to take a look at Hierapolis. I want you to find those two cities, and then I want you to find uh, where Laodicea is in relation to those two places. In Colossae, there were cold springs. In Hierapolis, there were hot springs. Both of them flowed down channels, streams, into a major stream that flowed through Laodicea. Well, if you take spring water that is cold, and if you take hot water, and you mix them together, what do you come up with? Lukewarm. Added to that, in the hot springs of Hierapolis, you, if you were to take a look at them, you would find that the basins are, are pure white. So you find the calcium deposit that is there, and you find it's full of minerals. You take the minerals that are in the hot water, you mix it with the minerals that are in the cold water, you put them in the singular stream, and it comes down through Laodicea, and you've got lukewarm water, and you drink the lukewarm water that is filled with minerals, and what's it gonna do to your belly? Well, I wanna let you know it's gonna turn everything into reverse. You're gonna wanna vomit from it. So that's one thing I want you to remember. Uh, how many of you have ever had the occasion, wherever you have been, to be in a therapeutic hot tub? Is it soothing? Is it refreshing? Maybe you went from a hot tub to cold water, and it was, you know, maybe an ice bath, and, and it was administered for therapeutic reasons. People both in Colossae and people also in Hierapolis used the cold water and they used the hot water for therapeutic reasons and it was refreshing to them. Nobody was soaking their feet in the water at Laodicea. It was lukewarm. I would venture to say that many of you had a hot cup of coffee or a hot cup of tea this morning. Maybe there are some that even had an iced tea or an iced coffee this morning. But I would also venture to say that none of you had a lukewarm cup of coffee or a lukewarm cup of tea. Maybe if you had a, that cup sitting for a while on your counter or on your table, uh, maybe you tried to take a sip of it and you took it and well, you just didn't like it anymore. God is wanting us, Christ is wanting us to be refreshing, hot or cold. He doesn't want us to be lukewarm. As a result, he says, if you are lukewarm, I will spew thee out of your, my mouth. Because that's exactly what you would do if you drank this water from this stream in Laodicea. Think it through. Where does the Lord want me? And then you and I have to ask ourselves this question all the time. Are we lukewarm? How can I tell if I'm lukewarm? I think that's a legitimate question. To whom do I need to compare myself to see whether or not I am lukewarm? Or whether I'm refreshing? And cold, don't think of cold as being cold spiritually. Just think refreshing. Am I refreshing to people that I'm around spiritually? I think that's a good question to ask. How am I progressing in the things of the Lord? Ask yourself these things. Only you can answer them. God already knows the answer. Why don't you ask the Lord to give you the answer concerning those things? I often challenge people who come into my study, if you want a good analysis, a, 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 a good examination, of how you think you are spiritually, ask your spouse, but make sure you sign a contract or something that tells them there's gonna be no retaliation if you tell me exactly the truth. Ask your children, 
what they think of your Christian life. It might be very revealing. Or are you chicken? Maybe you're chicken. Go ahead and do it. See what others think of how you're living the Christian life. All right, let's move on just a little bit. I have uh, a few minutes left. Let's move to the next slide here. For those of you who are watching, the message of Jesus concerning the compromises that were made by the Laodiceans, not to mention the many Jewish individuals that were there that had made them lukewarm about everything. What makes us lukewarm? Let's look at these verses once again. Uh, there were so many things that were causing them to substitute uh, for spirituality. Uh, they thought these things were spiritual, to substitute things that they thought were making them appear to be blessed of God. Once again, in verse number 15, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. Because thou art lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Okay? So there was trade and business things that were going on. Let's uh, consider the wealth in verse number 17 that was happening that ties back to verses 14 and 15 and 16. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Look at the descriptive things that are there. Now, this thing that has happened to us, was, was, to us with the COVID-19 virus, are things beginning to get a little out of hand? Uh, yesterday, uh, there have been protests around the country, not in every state, not in every city. What's happening? Well, people can't work, they can't put food on their table, they can't pay their bills. The government has stepped in to try to supplement us. People are tired of being cooped up in their own house, not able to go anywhere. Well, I want to let you know that one of the things that we were touting about ourselves is that, look, the stock market is at 29,000, about to go over to 30,000. It did go over 30,000. But how quickly the mighty fall. It tumbled. There was fear of a Great Depression coming, perhaps because of the skill of some of our economists guiding and directing our government officials, maybe, maybe it's not going to be that because it's ticked up a little bit. But were we boasting of how much we were working and how much we were making and so on? We're rich. And we are increased with goods. Isn't it a great thing that even during a time like this, you can still go to a grocery store and find food on the shelf? I can remember my wife and I walking into a, uh, a grocery store on a little island that we were ministering on and being surprised that they had only two kind of cereals, uh, Frosted Flakes and Cheerios, and that was all that you could buy, and there were only a few boxes of those. There wasn't much in the large meat case. Maybe a chicken, maybe a little bit of ground beef, and that was about it. There weren't many soup cans. We went to a large grocery store. We found that its counters weren't like what we were used to. Or increased with goods. Um, now listen, I wanna, I'm, I'm not bragging here because I'm using all that I'm telling you and causing this broadcast to happen this way. I've got two laptops. Boy, doesn't that make me special. I've got a big one for heavy work and I've got a small one for showing my PowerPoint and this morning it is broadcasting over Facebook. The larger one is doing Zoom. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Um, how many Bibles do you have in your house? Have you counted them up lately? I've got a whole shelf full of Bibles. 
Some that are falling apart, they've been with me for 50 years. Uh, some of them, the, the, the bindings are coming apart, but they've got notes in them uh, that I refer back to every now and then if I can keep the pages together. Uh, my kids borrowed them when they went to school. They said this when I questioned why they took my Bible. They said, it's because in Bible class, Dad, you've got all the answers written in the columns. That's literal. I like to put quotation marks around that. Now listen, we're increased with goods. How many cars do you have? Do you have a car and a truck? Do you have two cars? How many clothes are in your closet? Have you ever stood in front of your full closet and said, I don't have a thing to wear, so you went out to the store and bought something else? How many pairs of shoes do you have? If you were to open your cupboards, your refrigerator, your freezer, is it full? How many of us have the luxury of sleeping in a bed under a roof that doesn't leak? We're increased with goods. There are some of us out there that have multiple homes. You have one that you live in and you have one that you play in. We are increased with goods. I want to tell you this, that in the poor countries that I have visited, they don't have much. They don't have a boat to go on on Sunday morning to go fishing with at some lake. They don't have a cottage to go to over the weekend so they're back in the woods. They don't have enough money to go from one place to another over a long weekend and they're skipping out on church. They don't have any of those particular things. And so guess where they are on Sunday morning and because they don't have vehicles in places and I was enjoying looking at pictures that uh, doing a little cleanup on my one laptop, I ran across a, uh, a little PowerPoint that I put together with some pictures that I had forgotten about of Haiti. And I could remember the day that I had to give a testimony in this one church in St. Mark. And people were jammed in the pews, in the windows. They don't have stained glass windows like we have. They were jammed outside, huddling against the walls. I remember having to step over the top of people on the Sunday morning in order to get to the pulpit. But they don't have two sticks to rub together to start a fire. But oh, we have plenty. Watch the contrast. God says you have all these things but you don't know that you're poor and wretched and blind. Because I met some of those people, those precious people down there in Haiti who had the hymn book memorized because they didn't know how to read. They had chapter after chapter after chapter of the Bible memorized. They prayed. I met a doctor who had a prayer meeting at 4 a.m. in the morning and at 6 o'clock, he started to see 100 patients through the day in his clinic. And the next morning, he started the same thing. And he had a lovely family. When I compare myself to him, I am poor and wretched and miserable. And I'm blind. He had a keen insight and a joy that nobody could take away. For us, if our Xbox breaks down, it's the end of the world. Are we in the Laodicean time? They had wealth. They had all kind of wealth. Let's put a check mark there. We'll finish up with this next week. Let's have a word of prayer, and I'm going to have Shane come and take over. Our Father, thank you for this time that we can spend in the book of Revelation. We're praying that you will help us not to be individuals that are poor and wretched and naked and blind but that would, you would help us to do a good examination of ourselves. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Shane? All right, good morning, everyone. We're going to have now the uh, children's Sunday school lesson. And so I have a couple of things I'm going to need to have to have set up here. That must be interesting. Just enough. All right. Thank you. 
All right, for our lesson this morning, we're going to look at the uh, first John in chapter 1. And here the Bible says in verse 5, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you uh, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Here the Bible is teaching us about sin and confession and walking in the light. What does all of this mean? Well, God says here that if we say we have not sinned, we make God a liar. If we say we have not sinned when God says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And yet if we say, well, I don't have any sin. Well, then we are saying God is not telling the truth when he says all have sinned. So the first thing we need to understand is that we need to obey God, we need to listen to what God says, and when he says we are a sinner, then we need to understand how we are a sinner. And that is, sin is anything you think, anything you say, anything you do that breaks God's law. Now, what sins could I think of that we might do? Hmm. Is lying a sin? Yes or no? Yes. How about stealing, taking something that's not yours? Is that sin? Mm, yes. How about disobeying our mom and dad? Is that sin? Well, yes. The Bible says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. So if we disobey our parents, then we sin against God. And God says, all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So if we have sin, we have a problem, don't we? So first we need to agree with God. That's what the word confess means. To be in agreement with God, that we have sin. And how we get that sin taken care of is that we come to God and we confess our sin unto Him. Now, we need to first do this in order to be saved. We need to believe that Jesus died for our sins because we are a sinner, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And then when we believe in the Lord Jesus, we call on his name and we say, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin. Come in my life and be my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. And that's the type of understanding, calling out unto God, believing that we are a sinner, and we ask Him to save us from our sin. Now, after you've done that, and you become a child of God, then we also need to confess our sins after we get saved. For the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, plural, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so after we get saved, we may still do wrong because we have a sinful nature and we need to come to God and we need to ask for his forgiveness and he promises forgiveness. Now I'm going to use a little illustration here. I have some water, as you can see. And we're going to illustrate what the blood of Jesus Christ does for us in forgiving our sin. You know, the Bible says in uh, verse 7, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. All right, the first thing I'm going to do is I have a bowl here, and I'm going to pour some water into it. And what I'm 
going to do is I'm going to take a piece of paper here. I have two pieces of paper. All right? And so I'm going to take a piece of paper here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut it up into some pieces here. And I'm going to list some sins on these pieces of paper. Isn't that nice? Now, what kind of sins might someone do? Hmm. Well, I'll tell you, we're going to write one we're going to put lying on here, okay? And we're going to say, oh, disobey. Mom or dad. What else are we going to put on here? Oh, we could put on cheating, right? Cheating. We could put on here evil speaking or gossip. Oh, that's one. And so I got four different ones here. You see that? See it on the paper? I don't know if you can read that there. There we are. Everybody see that? All right. So we're going to cut them up, and we're going to put them in the water. So we're going to say, just by way of illustration, let's say you have done some lying in your time. Oh, it only takes one to be a liar. Perhaps you disobeyed mom or dad in your time. Perhaps you cheated on something. Perhaps you gossiped. You spread something that was not true around. Or maybe it was true, uh, but you weren't supposed to be spreading it around because that's gossip. Okay? And so what we're going to do is now we're going to take care of it on our own. What does that look like? Well, it's saying, well, I just think uh, uh, we'll just forget about it and we won't tell anybody. And it'll just go away on its own. So you know, first we're going to put lying in the water. And we're going to mix it around. And you know what I find? No matter how much you mix it around in the water, lying is still there, right? And if we were to, let's take disobeying our mom and dad. And let's say we disobey our mom and dad, and we just say, well, it's not that bad. And we just put it in the water. Perhaps we take cheating and we put it in the water and we take gossip, and we just handle it our own way, and we really don't do anything about it. We just do what we think is best, and it gets all mixed up. And what we're going to be able to hopefully show here is that it's still in the water. I don't think we can get a, a picture here. Is there a way to bring that down here a little bit? Just for the way Bill Bill sure, we're going to see if we can get which one you want to do? Um, the zoom one. And so he's going to show. Everybody see that in there still? All right, very good. All right, next we're going to take, we're going to put water in a different bowl. But this time what we're going to do is that we're going to now demonstrate this by using something special. We're going to put something special in the water. To help turn the water red. And this is going to represent the blood of the Lord Jesus. Okay, can you see that it's red? Yes, all right, very good. Now we'll take another piece of paper. And we're going to write some of these same things on it, okay? We're going to write lying. We're going to put disobeying. We're going to put cheating. And we're going to put gossip on here. 
Now, God tells us in order to have forgiveness of sin is that we need to walk in the light in verse 7 as he is in the light. And how do we walk in that light? And that is that we confess our sin to God. And we have forgiveness and cleansing. And if we wrong someone else, if we sin against somebody else, then we also ask for their forgiveness. And you know what the Bible says? The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. You know what we're going to do? We're going to put these papers that have uh, all the different sins on here. We're going to put them in what's going to represent the blood of Jesus Christ. Everybody see that? See, we we'll put them in there. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to mix them all up. And look where they went. They all disappeared. Now let's look in the other bowl, going our own way. What happened to those ones? Down a little bit. Oh, they're still there, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, they're, they're still there. The only way we find forgiveness of sin is in the blood of Jesus Christ. And so if you've never been saved, you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and have your sins put under the blood. And if you are saved and you are born again, you're a child of God. If we do wrong, we need to confess our sins to God. And if we sin against our mom or dad or brother or sister or someone else, we need to ask their forgiveness too. And God says when we walk in the light... By confessing our sins, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from how many sins? All our sins. Let's have a word of prayer together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time this morning in a Sunday school lesson. Help us to remember to confess our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.